Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Quick note about the foundation. Uh, We started on our depression and anxiety uh, massive literature overview. This is going to include lectures and peer-reviewed papers and books and interviews with people that uh, suffer from anxiety and depression. The whole goal is to assemble as much information as possible, uh, all, all treatments possible for anxiety and depression. I know we won't get there, but if we can get to a, a significant percentage, um, I believe this will encompass more than any one practitioner may know, and it could be a great resource for people suffering. So to find out more, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org. And today, my guest is uh, Denise Potter. Uh, she's uh, big into the ketogenic diet, and we're going to talk about her work and her consulting. Uh, she runs Potter Dietitian Consulting, LLC. So Denise, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Well, tell me a bit about your, your history. How did you become aware of ketogenic diets and the, when, that, when did that happen? Like, what's your background? All right. So my background is I've been a registered dietitian nutritionist for, well, about 30 years now. I've been working in ketogenic diet therapy for 15 years. And I honestly uh, kind of just fell into that as part of my job at University of Michigan um, hospitals up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Through that program, working with pediatric epilepsy, I saw just how amazing um, ketogenic therapy worked for these kids. And it was just the best thing I'd ever done as a dietitian to hear parents say, literally to say, I got my kid back because of the diet therapy we did. And I had never done anything in my life as a dietitian that had been so impactful or so meaningful or, you know, changed lives that much. And so it was pretty exciting. And then from there, people started calling my office um, asking me to put them on the diet for cancer and different conditions. And I, well, I couldn't do that through the hospital. It wasn't, you know, I, it, this was for pediatrics at the hospital. So, so I ended up eventually kind of hanging a shingle out and started seeing people on the side for different health conditions that the diet was effective for. And we'll mm-hmm. go into those. And anyway, and it just grew. It grew to the point of two full-time jobs and I had to pick one. So about four years ago, I left my day job and have been full-time consulting ever since. That's really cool. So what conditions do you primarily uh, educate people on how to use a ketogenic diet to help? Okay, so I still um, heavily um, use the diet for epilepsy for adults and pediatric patients, uh, autism, cancer, Alzheimer's, GLUT1 deficiency, I'm just naming off the list here, diabetes, migraines, bipolar, you mentioned um, um, depression and anxiety, absolutely, the ketogenic ketogenic therapy is a great help for that, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and um, you know, to name a few, there are any any neurological condition is pretty tempting uh, to try the diet for. Yeah, no, that's excellent. So for the different uh... People that you treat, you know, let's start, I guess, with, with kids with epilepsy. 
how do you introduce the diet to the parents and like what what are some of the first steps and uh you know how do kids react wow so when someone first starts you know having a child with seizures in general you know they're going to put them on a medication and you know 70 percent of people within the first one or two medications that will you know essentially manage their epilepsy that leaves 30% 30% of people that have what we call intractable epilepsy, meaning, you know, the medications just aren't working. And so it's that 30% that we tend to see, although we definitely will see kids first line treatment for the diet. If the parents want to do that, that's not so common within the centers at the hospitals, but parents will come to me and want to use diet therapy before medication anyway. But if they're interested in ketogenic therapy, you know, after two medications have been trialed, that's, and there's a great position paper out from people all over the world that say, you know, that are in agreement, basically, you know, consensus statement saying that after two meds have been trialed, that the ketogenic diet is the next effective treatment that should be trialed for these patients. And um, believe it or not, it's not commonly the next effective treatment that's trialed because um, of our healthcare system of lack of dietitians, of lack of physician knowledge um, about the diet and its impact. Just a few, you know, loose statistics. Once the second med has failed, you've got between, and there are different numbers depending on how, you know, people sway the statistics, but between a three and 25% chance that that third, fourth, fifth medication is going to help that patient with their seizures. But the diet at that point has a 50 to 70% chance. This is through trials, studies, you know, legitimate you know, scientific information, 50 to 70% chance that that diet is going to help that, that child with their epilepsy. And the statistics are also very good for adult epilepsy. So does anyone uh, say to you right off the bat, I don't want to take any of these medications. I just want to straight up try this first. Absolutely. Yeah. People do that. Um, again, I have parents that come to me and do that. Um, sometimes when they do that within centers, they're kind of constrained by their, um, you know, by the the rules of the hospital, you know, where they can't do that because it's, you know, recommended after two meds. But definitely when they come to me as a private practice dietitian, I'm not constrained by that. And I, I really wonder what those numbers would be if you try the diet first line for people. Of course, it's a lot easier to take a pill, you know, um, for people than to make a big dietary change. But um, a lot of the medications have a lot of, you know, very intolerable side effects for some people. And so it's a great idea. So what does the uh, ketogenic diet look like normally? And then how is it tweaked for, uh, you know, kids that have epilepsy? Well, so it looks, there are a lot of faces to ketogenic diet. And we'll, and I like to call it too, I'm going to say ketogenic therapy, because, you know, diet kind of is almost a bad word, right? So I like to think of it as a therapy because it's a medical nutrition therapy that we're using to treat conditions. And so there are five different versions of ketogenic therapies. And I'll just run through them. There's a classic ketogenic diet, which is a very high ratio. So very high fat and people are very much into counting the macros. So let's say that it's going to be in an 80 to 90% fat range, but we call it a three to one or four to one. And then there's a modified ketogenic diet, which is also very strict, but it's more of a one to one, two to one, maybe at 70 to 80% fat content. There's an MCT diet, which means we use MCT oil to provide, you know, 40 to 60% of the calories, which is huge, but the MCT oil makes great ketones. And so you can eat more carbs if you drink, you know, eat eat slash drink a lot of MCT oil. And then there's a modified Atkins diet, which is kind of what a lot of people um, might be doing that are saying they're on keto, um, where you're just basically counting carbs and you're trying to, you know, maybe limit your protein, but modified Atkins by the strict, strictest nature is just counting and limiting the carb intake, eating fat ad lib and protein relatively ad lib. Although, you know, that's not effective if you get too much protein. And then the last version of the diet um, found by, um, started by my friend Heidi Pfeiffer over at Mass General, she um, found that she could be even looser with the diet and it's called low glycemic index treatment. And there are a lot of conditions that don't need high ketosis and can still have benefit um, with seizures um, and, you know, improvements in behaviors and seizures. So that treatment also allows 40 to 60 grams of carb and and encourages fat and, you know, moderate protein. And it's a little less strict version of the diet. So, yeah, so all of those 
our versions of the diet. And sometimes we blend them a little bit and see how strict. But when we start people on the diet, I like to start and people vary how they do this. I like to start people very strict at the beginning and then let them loosen up. So maybe a couple of weeks of being really strict and even measuring their foods and having some specific menus and then letting them loosen up as they learn, okay, this is what it took to get into ketosis. And we track their ketones with a, a blood meter. A lot of people have heard of um, the Precision Extra or the Keto Mojo or a couple of common meters that they're just blood glucose meters that also test ketones. And it's just a simple finger poke to test their ketones and see if the diet is getting into potentially therapeutic range. What, what is that in terms of, let's say, millimoles with the, you know, with the ketogenic range? Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. So that's a great question. Um, and I'll first preface it by saying ketones don't tell us the whole story. They're not the end-all, be-all, but they're just something we can measure. We can't measure your GABA receptors and your neurotransmitters in your brain, but we can measure the ketones in your blood. So we use that to see if are we getting um, the body in the physiological state of ketosis. So with kids, as a general rule, I love to get their, their ketones over four, between four and seven millimoles. With adults, I'm shooting somewhere between one and three usually, although I have some adults that can get in the three, four range, five range, and that's great if they can get that high and still feel well. But, um, and, but the first line is get them over one. And then once I get them over one, like, all right, let's get over two. And then if it's reality for them to get, you know, over three, then we, we go for that too. But again, somewhere often in that two to three ranges where adults will land because they're not growing and in a state of anabolic state like kids are. So the kids tend to, uh, because of their state of growth, they tend to have better ketones. So what is someone that's at a one or one and a half versus a three or four? What do they experience? You know, is there a deep ketosis versus a regular ketosis? Some people can really feel it. Uh, it's interesting. It's kind of like people with diabetes sometimes can tell you, oh my gosh, yeah, my sugar is 100 or it's 200, it's 300. They can feel that. And so some people when they're in ketosis definitely feel it. Most people feel a lot more energy. They think clearer. Um, they sleep better. Just a lot of, you know, they say brain fog is decreased. And so, but as far as that difference, you know, it gets kind of a fine line. Like, do you feel way better in the threes versus the ones? That's, that's really individual. You may not, you know, the first goal is, you know, once you're over technically over 0.5, they call that therapeutic, you know, or, you know, nutritional ketosis. Although, you know, with epilepsy, that's generally very often not enough to do that. But with other conditions, um, maybe with diabetes, and we just need someone to get their glucose levels down maybe 0.5 to 1 is, is great. They don't need super high ketones. So it kind of depends what we're going for as to how high we shoot for. Well, what, what are some of the main foods that comprise, you know, the ketogenic diet for both kids and adults? So the ketogenic therapy, the, the main things we're going to uh, provide an adequate protein. So protein being any of your meats. So if, again, assuming you're not a vegetarian, you can have, you know, chicken, beef, pork, eggs, cheese, lamb, you know, bison, it doesn't matter. You can have any, any protein source. I tend to not encourage a lot of processed meats, but in general, any protein source, that's going to be way less than a lot of people would consider if it's on a strict, strict ketogenic therapy. Some people, I think, kind of misunderstand keto as just being, you know, eat all the meat you want. And that generally is not going to get therapeutic levels of ketones. And then we're going to have low carb vegetables. And that's going to mean lots of leafy greens, you know, broccoli, cauliflower, zucchini. You can have some things people sometimes think you can't have any carrots or any onions or any tomatoes, but yes, you can. If you like this podcast, 
please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. I like to give lists of very specific you know, things and in, in the amounts you can have, again, as a starting point, be a little picky at the beginning so you kind of see what you can get away with and still get into ketosis. And so we're allowing those carbs. And then the next, very little fruit, you know, some fruits, and we lean toward berries, uh, toward raspberries and strawberries is real great. And blackberries is great, you know, relatively low carb fruits. And then the biggest portion of the diet is going to be fat. And this is what's hard for people to be in a true therapeutic ketogenic diet. We're getting over 70% of your calories from fat. That means butter, olive oil, macadamia oil, avocado oil, cream, lard, sour cream, you know, different um, items like that. And, and of course, fatty meats and such too, but definitely an MCT oil. I want to forget MCT oil with any therapy, any ketogenic therapy, I'm always putting as much MCT as someone can tolerate in there to get their ketones up, hopefully at a lower fat percentage, lower ratio. How do people react when they eat, they first start eating that way? Do they go, oh my God, I'm so full or like it, or they think it's gross? Well, so, uh, you know, 10 years ago when people first started doing it, they're like, oh my gosh, you know, this is crazy. And we used to put, say with kids, we put them on a much higher ratio. And what we've learned, and I've learned with children and adults, is I don't start you out at where I want you. You know, if the doctor puts you on a medication, they don't generally start you out at the highest dose, right? You start at a low dose and you titrate up. And that's what I try to do with people on the diet. So I'll start them out at typically uh, in just ratio numbers at a one to one or a 1.5 to one ratio, which means, you know, 70% fat, maybe 75% fat, which if, if you look at that on a plate, if I could show you a picture, you'd see almost half the plate is vegetables, a very small portion of meat, and then lots of butter and oil with that. And it's not really a one to one's not really that hard to do. Uh, if you're willing to forego the bread and the pastas and things. But then from there, once they get used to eating that extra fat, and maybe we do it in tricky ways, maybe it's in a smoothie, maybe it's MCT in your coffee, maybe it's a fat bomb. So once they get used to that, and we figure out what their ketones are, then we start increasing that fat gradually. When, when we do that, we have to drop the protein a little, or maybe drop the carb a little, you know, to tip it so we keep their calories the same. But no, people, people are generally very satisfied. That's why sometimes with people with doing a keto weight loss diet, they're satisfied more, let's say if they can only eat 1500 calories, if that's a lot of fat, it's more satisfying than 1500 calories of high carb because the carbs just digest super quickly. They're in and out and your blood sugar goes up and then it crashes down. And when your blood sugar goes back down, you're hungry and you're hangry. And that's one cool thing I always tell people with keto. I say, you're not going to be hangry anymore. And what we have is a stabilization of the blood glucose levels. So you aren't having the highs and lows, which is why this is great for diabetes. And when you crash down that, again, that's when you get hangry and you get really stressed and you shaky and need food. When you get hungry on keto, you're just, you're just kind of hungry. And you're like, man, I'm hungry. And then if you don't get to food for an hour, it's really not a big deal. At least that's how I feel. That's how a lot of my clients. Feel. Yeah. Well, I noticed, you know, when I did it, or cancer you know, years ago is I was getting like insanely ravenously hungry though. I would eat like four eggs and you know, something else. And then I'd be starving 10 minutes later and eat more, eat more. And it seemed sometimes hard to get full. And again, the hunger was like a ravenous hunger. It was weird. It took a while to settle down. Yeah. So, well, it's sometimes though people do, and I don't know, you know, exactly how it went for you, but sometimes people just aren't eating enough calories because they cut out the carbs and then they eat, you know, moderate protein. Well, four eggs is 300 calories, you know, and that's not much. If that's all you have for breakfast with 300 calories, you probably need six, which means, you know, if you didn't cook that in three tablespoons of butter, you were probably really hungry, you know? So sometimes it's because they don't get enough fat in with it. And sometimes that's why their ketones don't go high enough. And if you're losing weight, sometimes you know, you're burning, making lots of ketones. And if you're losing weight, that's ketones are going nice and high, but you're, again, not providing the calories that you might need. What about the, uh, I've heard there's the keto flu. Some people don't feel well for maybe the first couple of weeks when they switch to this diet. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I always tell people if they listen to me, they won't get keto flu. And so, yeah, yeah, when people do though, what is it like? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was just kind of bragging. 
Yeah, yo, exactly. That's what I'm saying is we want, I want to prevent it. So what keto flu is, uh, you end up feeling, you know, lethargic, sick, maybe nauseated, vomiting. And it's a result of partly an electrolyte imbalance, probably your body's diuresing, you're, you know, shooting out a lot of fluids. You're probably not getting enough um, sodium and potassium and magnesium. And so those things are off. At the same time, you're also very commonly acidotic, which is why this diet is often initiated in the hospital for pediatrics, because we watch their CO2, because sometimes they get acidotic when you ramp up the diet really quickly. So what I like to do is always start the diet slowly. So very commonly, I'll have people start out and say, all right, for two, three days, I want you to change your breakfast. And they'll change that. They'll kind of get comfortable with eating a keto breakfast. And then like, all right, now we're going to change either lunch or dinner. You pick. And now they're doing two keto meals for a couple of days. So now your body's used to a, another third less carbohydrates. And then we go to the third meal keto, you know, on a day five, six, seven. And then we change over the snacks. So it's really a very comfortable seven to 10 day progression, as opposed to a, today I eat 300 grams of carbohydrate and tomorrow I eat 20. You know, that's going to throw you off every time. There And I'll just put a plug in. There's a nice little keto flu handout prevention on the Charlie Foundation website. It's charliefoundation.org. And they have a nice little, um, I said, a nice little paper they put together for keto flu. That's cool. That makes a lot of sense to ease people into it like that. For some reason, I haven't really heard much of that. It's either like do the diet and just get through it or, or don't. Well, that makes a lot of sense what you're well, saying. I have to say that a lot of people talking about it aren't trained professionals, you know, I mean, a lot of people are, are not really thinking through that. I look at it and think, wow, do I want someone that I'm working with to land in the ER because of the recommendations I made? Do I, you know, do I want them to be sick for four days or can I, you know, can I give them this in such a way that they can go into it and be healthy and do, you know, do fine. Now here's the other side of it. I have some people that have brain tumors and they need to go onto the diet very quickly, or they need to fast for several days before they go on chemotherapy. And if that's the case, and there, and you'll see some of that on that keto flu handout, but we're going to give them, we're going to give them a potassium supplement, probably some magnesium, and usually I use baking soda in a prescribed amount in order to offset that, you know, initial imbalance that happens. So if someone's going to go on diet really quickly, we do offset it with that and, and adequate fluids. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. What is it like when someone's on the diet, you know, let's say for 10 days, are there any other changes they should make after a month, two, three months, six months? Do they take breaks on the diet? Like what, what does it look like more longer term? Okay, so good question. So longer term, and, and often when I start people on the diet, um, I usually tell them, hey, that to really see the changes that you that you want to see in general, whether it's cancer treatment or diabetes or seizures or um, migraines, that you've got to give this three to four months to give it a really fair play. OK, so don't you know, it's all like don't say you did keto unless you gave it a fair, you know, a fair shake. So over that time period, I want to get their ketones up into, you know, a goal range. Again, adults, you know, one to three. Um, preferably two to three millimoles, um, kids, hopefully over four, although I can, you know, we can have improvements and things way under that. Again, just those are really loose goals for ketones. And so, you know, we, we play with that ratio and kind of keep moving it up. We keep titrating up the MCT oil and just gradually transition to maximize the diet. And it can take, let's say a month to just kind of maximize the diet for people. I usually, you know, talk to people at least once a week, and just, you know, fine tune and make those changes, get their ketones as high as we can. And then we're going to cruise for a while and just see, okay, can I maintain this and let the brain do its job? Let the neurotransmitters change, let the ketones do their work, let the lower glucose have its impact and see how much it's going to, you know, impact the condition we're treating. Oh, and you also, you also asked about breaks and, you know, and I know I hear people talk about cheat days, like, uh, you know, I, I hate that. I hate that word because, uh, you know, when you're on the diet, when you're on this, again, medical nutrition therapy for a medical condition, man, I, I don't do cheat days. I really don't. I mean, there might be a, there might be some meals that you, know, you have at a lower fat percentage, a lower ratio on occasion, you know, to kind of let yourself have something, but I really discourage it when it's for that. 
And I'll give, I'm going to give a, an example of a um, someone who wanted a cheat day. I said, you can't have a cheat day. I said, I'll let you have a, you know, one meal off a month. They want one day a month. I said, I'll give you one meal a month. Okay. And I'll tell you this particular person. Well, it, it was a, a couple and one of them, their blood sugar has gone from in the 400s and they were about to be put on insulin and they're ranging in the 130 to 180 range now. Okay. And that's after two, three months on the diet. And the, the wife, her, all her joints had been feeling better. Her blood sugar is under control. Many, you know, things were feeling better for her as well. And they had a Whopper and a large fry for their cheat meal. The one, the blood sugar, of course, spiked. They felt terrible, miserable. And the wife pain all weekend. She spent almost three days in bed and just felt literally, she said, just, I felt like crap. And I don't think she said crap. Wow. And, and they was like, and I, and I told them, I said, well, I, I'm going to have to say, I told you so. Cause I did tell you so I said, you're not going to feel good if you do this. So they took their body from being a state of ketosis and feeling good and having energy and being energy being provided by fat. And they went and, and just, you know, just blew it out. So, so yeah, that's, that's a danger of cheat days. You just aren't going to feel well. Yeah. I've, I've, well, I've been through that exact thing and yeah, you don't feel good at all. So then um, if you're tempted later on to cheat, you kind of like barely cheat. And then, you know, if you really stick with it, then you just, you just say to yourself, no, I don't want, I don't want to feel sick. I'm not doing it. Yeah. It. It's pretty motivating when you get, a, you know, when you get immediate results like that. Yeah. That's really cool. What, um, what makes it hard for people where they fall down or give up or they, they just, you know, they, they tell you they're doing it, but they're really not like what, what so happens I, to cause problems? Yeah. So I think, so two of the hardest things, one is if they're not seeing results, right? You know, you can, we can hang in with things if we see results, you know, if it's for your blood sugar and it's coming down, you're seeing results, but if it's for, you know, but if it's not coming down, you're not seeing benefit, then, you know, then it's really hard to keep doing and it. Sometimes you don't see benefit from the diet right away. Sometimes it really takes a couple months and that is a long time. Um, I remind people that, you know, usually when the doctor gives you medication, they're like, see you in three months and, you know, let me know if it works. You know, that's typical because changes do take that long, but that's a long time to keep day in, day out doing something if you're not sure if it's working. Um, so that's one thing that's hard, you know, if you're not seeing benefit. And the second thing that I think is super hard is travel. I find it, you know, really difficult to, uh, you know, to do the things I want when I'm traveling and I'll think, oh, I'll be able to get, you know, proper foods or get, you know, get something I can at least get a salad or whatever. And sometimes you just can't get what you thought you could get. And then you've got to make a decision. Am I going to go off the diet? Am I going to um, maybe just fast instead? If smart, we'll plan ahead and we'll pack. And that's, I just really, because of my experience traveling, I really push my patients to think really hard about their travel and about how they're going to handle that. Do they need to take food or, you know, who are they with? Where can they go? What about restaurant? All those things. Because I think that's, I just think it's an especially hard thing to stick with it then. Yeah. I remember one time I was traveling. I think the only thing they had to eat were like these baguettes, you know, with, but they had egg and ham in them and stuff. And you know, I, I bought like, I don't know, four baguettes and just piled up the bread and ate the centers. And it was enough, and but there was like this gigantic pile of bread. I felt <laughs> yeah. weird, but what are you supposed to do? Sometimes, you know, if it's really bad enough, you just can't eat for a while. You, know, you just got to drink water and stuff because there's nothing good. Yeah, and sometimes I encourage people to try that, or maybe you know, going through an airport is it might just be just as easy to say, you know, what I'm fasting that day. Or a lot of people fast, you know, a day a week or a day a month anyway, and just as easy to say, all right, I'm just. I'll just fast that day. That'd be easier than trying to manipulate your environment. Sometimes that works, but I'm really yeah, happy sense. with, with, um, you know, with, with my clients, I, I feel like, you know, they, they put a lot of thought into it before they go somewhere and they work hard. Sometimes they take things or they just, again, just plan ahead. I think if you plan ahead, you know, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Right. And just a little bit of, of planning ahead goes a long way with travel. What are your thoughts about the, taking exogenous ketones, you know, drinking them, those, those uh, ketone powders and stuff? Well, so I, I tend to ride the fence on these, okay, because um, obviously they'll put, your, they'll put your levels up a little. 
And again, not against them. They're, you know, they, they're being researched and I think they may have their place, you know, in the long run. And if I have clients that say, I want to use those, I'm like, okay, cool. Let me know what your ketones are before and after. And let's, you know, let's just kind of keep track and see if it helped you. The net, the downside of it is, you know, some of them are pretty expensive. And I, I do tell people, well, I can get you there with, so you can use those if you want, but, but I can totally get you there with food and MC oil. And then um, the other side of it is, and this is, I'm, I'm not a researcher, okay? So this is my common sense saying, when you produce ketones in your body, you've gone through this whole physiological process, right? To produce those ketones. Part of that process, uh, a lot more of that process than ketones are probably the beneficial medical you know, side effects that we have that are helping. And so when you just drink ketones, you're not causing your body to go through all those processes. You're just drinking them and putting the number up in your blood. So I don't see how it can have all the same benefit. At the same time, research is ongoing. And and again, I'm not against them. I'm really curious to see if if they are helpful and are they a part of our treatment? You know, some people, they're definitely in some cancer protocols and I, you know, totally support, you know, people when they're using them, but I haven't come to the point of saying, Hey, I want you to go out and buy these. You know, it's part of my treatment for you. I haven't gotten there yet. So any advice for people that are having a hard time trying to do it on their own, you know, that haven't gone to you for help, you know, anything to say to people again in the beginning, middle or later on, how to maintain suggestions? Um, yeah. So one, a couple of the big things are um, looking at the amount of protein they're eating, because that's a really common mistake to be eating a pretty large quantity of protein. And our bodies only need, and this is, you know, really rough math, but about 0.8 grams of protein for every kilo that you weigh. Okay. So if you weigh 70 kilos, you only need whatever, 58, 56 grams of protein. And that's not much at all. So the amount of protein we need is shockingly small compared to what we tend to eat if you just think standard American diet. So the extra protein you eat is going to break down eventually to glucose in your blood. And when you're when you get extra glucose in your body, you you don't need to make ketones and ketones. We didn't really even say this at the very beginning, but ketones are the byproduct of burning fat. So when your body doesn't get enough carbohydrate, it's going to turn to something else for energy. And ketogenic diet is trying to get it to use so much fat, you know, provide so much fat for energy that that becomes the main fuel source. So you don't want to put in so much protein that your ketones, you know, drop because of that extra glucose from the protein. And then another super common problem when people come to me and there's like, ah, oh, having a hard time getting in ketosis or staying in ketosis is because they're eating, okay, 20 grams of carb a day or 30 grams of carb a day, but they might be eating that all at once or over only two meals and they really eat three. So maybe they're doing in the morning, they're having bullet coffee, you know, they're drinking MCT and butter in their coffee. And then they have kind of a moderate lunch, maybe a salad for lunch, but then they get to dinner and like, Hey, I've got 15, 20 grams of carb left. And they have those at dinner. Now your body once again says, Oh, thank you. Thanks for all those carbohydrates. It provides enough glucose in the blood that it will lower your ketones again. So sustained levels of carb and protein and fat through each meal is what we want. So kind of even, so if you're going to have 20 grams of carb in the day, you know, have you know, seven at breakfast, seven at lunch, and seven at dinner, you know, spread them out. And with that, you need the same amount of fat at each meal and the same amount of protein at each meal. That will give you the best sustained ketosis and not, you know, those exact numbers for everybody, but just the concept that you're keeping the meals balanced and the snacks balanced. If you just have an apple as a snack, you might say, well, I only had 15 grams of carb. I had a really small apple. Whoa, that's just going to knock you right out of ketosis. So you're saying, uh, Make sure all the meals are pretty consistent. Don't be really good. And then for your last meal, you know, try to use up your whole reserve exactly. all at once because it still will mess you up. Okay. Exactly. So if I, just for example, if I have, this only happens in kids again, but, but sometimes in pediatrics, their um, ketones will actually go too high, which rarely ever happens in adults. Okay. But if their ketones yeah. go too high, I will give them literally two, I'm getting right, two tablespoons of juice. That'll bring their ketones down two or three points, just that little bit, three or four grams of carb. So three or four grams of carb drops your ketones two or three points, and you are only (laughs) 2.5 to begin with. What happens when you eat three, four, five grams of carb with no fat with it? You know, boom, your ketones are gone. Your body says, again, thanks for the glucose. 
I didn't know it was so delicate to stay in it. It really is. It really is. Well, Denise, so uh, where, where do you serve people? Uh, can can it be done online or do they have to be local to you? Like where can people go for more information and help from you? So I'm all virtual. I'm all online. I see people literally all over the world. Really fun to meet people from all areas. So I my website is um, powderketogenic.diet and um, people can go on there and just, you know, sign up for individual appointments. And I, I love to work with people long-term packages. I have people I've worked with for years. And so that's how I love to function with um, a longer term program or I'll see people hourly. A lot of times people just have, you know, they're already on keto and they just have a few questions. They just think, I just need to bounce, you know, questions off somebody for an hour, get all these questions answered and then just, you know, and then move on with my diet. You know, I don't need a whole program. And so right. that's really fun to do too, to just do that and troubleshoot with people that are really doing a pretty good job, but they just kind of need a tune up. So I'm just going to run through a couple because it's just so exciting to see you know, all the different areas where keto works. We already talked about epilepsy. Uh, I've seen kids and adults become seizure free. Um, kids that um, following the diet, having a hundred seizures a day, literally now seizure free for a year. I had one little guy yeah. on four medications he came with he came to me. We had got him on the diet for about three months. As of July, he was down to two medications from four, and he's been seizure free for a year. I've seen people with breast cancer start the diet and when they go in for their scans, and the doctors say, "Oh my gosh, we almost can't even see it. We've never seen that before." You know, that's and, great. and 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 so that's exciting. I've seen I have patients with glioblastoma. And glioblastoma, most people are unfortunately die within 12 to 18 months. And I have one woman specifically who's five years out from that. Her ketones wow. rarely get above 1.5, but she's stuck on the diet. Now she did standard of care also. It wasn't only the diet. I have patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder that are, their lives have been changed. I don't have time to go into all of it. I'm gonna tell you real quick, one gentleman with schizophrenia, he couldn't go outside for a walk because you know, the voices... Yeah. He was just basically homebound, almost incapacitated. After three months of the diet, he was feeling better. And then we had about a three-month break, and I saw him again. And he said he just got back from skiing in Colorado. He left from Michigan to Colorado, and he couldn't go out and around the block when we met. So wow. that's one of my favorite stories because those conditions, the psychiatric conditions, and I'll put a plug in for Dr. Chris Palmer, who's really championing um, ketogenic therapy for these conditions. It's amazing. It's amazing. Okay. So yeah, so that diabetes, I mean, there's tons of information out there about diabetes and low carb and keto helping with that. So yeah, it's just a lot of fun. I just, I have a lot of fun doing this and I see so many people's lives change that I, you know, I can't imagine doing anything else. Well, very good. Well, Denise, thank you for coming on the podcast. And uh, again, where can people go to find you? Powder, it's www.powderketogenic.diet. And my um, email is powderketo at gmail.com. And I'd okay. be, yep, welcome. Welcome anyone who has questions. Well, Denise, again, thank you for coming. And I really appreciate the work you're doing. It's helping a lot of people. And, uh, you know, thank goodness there's people out there that do this. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.